morning. morning. And welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lauren, and I am one of the pastors here at First. And we also have Pastor Dwayne Carlisle, who will be coming to the front shortly, and he is the other pastor. Today's scripture recounts a familiar pattern um, that occurs in Israeli history. Israel sins. God disciplines them by letting them be conquered. And then when they're ready to repent, God gives them another chance and raises up a judge to lead and to rescue them. So as we worship this morning, we remind you that our worship extends beyond the walls of this building, beyond the time of our worship, and that all life is an act of praise to God. Our worship extends to the fellowship and service that takes place the entire week. I invite you to create a sacred space for our worship time together. And when directed, light a candle in your home as we light the candles of our worship space. By lighting this candle, we affirm that where there is light, there is understanding. Where there is understanding, there is compassion. Where there is compassion, there is possibility. And where there is possibility, there is transformation. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities it brings us. Let us enter into this time of worship as we light our candles together. walk the pathways of destruction, we are met by the God of peace and reconciliation. When we sit and wonder if there is any way we can be of help, we encounter the Holy One who invites us to faithful service. When we least expect it, the Holy One, through the Spirit, offers us life-giving water.
Let's have a moment of prayer. Patient God, each and every day you offer to us new hope and special blessings. From the rising of the sun to its descent, the light of your love pours on your creation. We love all these things, but we want to hold on to each of your blessings just for ourselves. Teach us to share openly and willingly with others. Forgive our selfishness and turn it into selflessness in service to you. Clear our minds and our spirits from sadness to a sense of joy and adventure. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You needed superhero hearing to hear that before. Did you hear that? Well, maybe we, we need to work on our superhero skills. So I have a question for you. Young disciples, gather around. Come on up. Come, come sit right here where I can see you. Can I see you? There you are. There, I see you. Thanks for joining. I have a question. Do you all have one of these? A beach towel? Now, I'm not going to say that when I was growing up, it snowed every day and we had to walk up to school uphill both ways, but we didn't, I did not have a beach towel when I was growing up until a little later. You know, we, my parents said, you know, a towel from the laundry and was just fine. When I got a beach towel, I thought, this is so cool. Why? Well, what do we do with beach towels? Well, they're the best superhero cape, aren't they? Of course, if you're, if you're about six or seven, you know, kind of about this high, this is just what you need. Of course, you have to find the biggest safety pin you can find. So if you had a little brother or sister that was in diapers, that was really helpful. Here we go. This is the biggest safety pin I got. Oh, it works. You guys like to play superhero there's all kinds of superhero movies and comics, right? I think of superheroes like Superman and Batman and Thor. But I'm leaving some out, aren't I? There's other superheroes like, well, Wonder Woman, Supergirl, Batgirl. But those really aren't the real superheroes that I want to talk about. Pastor Lauren, would you come up here for just a minute? In the Bible, there are women superheroes, and Pastor Lawrence has their names all over her stole. They're a little hard to read, but, but who are some of the superheroes on your stole, Pastor Lauren? What? She didn't know I was going to do this to yeah, her. Boy, that was, <laughs> this is what happens when you put people on the spot. That's why you've got to be a superhero so you can be super fast. But <laughs> I have Eve, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Ruth, Naomi, Esther, Judas, Mary, Elizabeth, and Mary of Magdalene. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Lauren. So I want to name some other superheroes in not just in the Bible, but in our church and in our Methodist church. And there's a few that I thought of that came to my mind that I want to make sure that as you have more time and you can check into uh, libraries or the, on the internet, some of our superheroes. One of our earliest superheroes of the church is Sojourner Truth. She was born a slave, and she, when uh, the state of New York made slavery illegal, she was emancipated, and she was a preacher of the gospel, and she was a Methodist. And then there's Georgia Harkness, who was the first woman to receive full professorship at a theological school. She was she was, uh, this was in 19, like 1920, 
and then she was um, ordained as a local deacon and then a local elder, but they wouldn't let her participate in general or annual conference. But she had a doctoral degree in theology. So she's one of the women who, who uh, made the case that women should be in ministry and paved the way for women to um, gain the... the um, the, the right to be ordained just like men. <clears throat> and so the first woman who was ordained in 1956 when the Methodist Church finally granted ordination rights to women was Maud Keister Jensen. And the first woman who was elected a bishop in the United Methodist Church in 1980. It wasn't until 1980, not that long ago. And that's uh, Marjorie Matthews. Our first African-American bishop was in 1984, Leontine Kelly. Our first Hispanic Latina bishop was Minerva Carcano, who is still a bishop today in California. And then in, in 2016, Karen Oliveta was the first LGBTQ woman and the first LGBTQ person to be elected as a bishop. These are superheroes. These are people who have gone and, and said that God has called me to do something even though that's not what the church thought was um, expected and what, what bishops look like and pastors and ordained people and professors. And Pastor Lauren today is going to tell a story about a, a, one of the heroes from the Bible. Sometimes that we call them heroes. I don't really care. What it is is it's somebody who was called by God and who listened to God's call and and responded to what God was asking her to do, and she was a leader, just like you can be for God as well. Let's pray. Would, would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for the leaders of the church, for those who have paved the way so many can follow in their footsteps. Thank you for their leadership. And thank you that because of them, I can be a leader too. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dwayne, for teaching the children of our church, children of all ages. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Judges, chapter 4, Verses 1 through 7. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagwim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barach, son of Abinoam from Kadesh, in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you, by the Wadi Kishnon, with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Holy words, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. Most people thank me after getting that phonics lesson, so we should give Karen a hand for, for reading that scripture today. Uh, <laughs> Let's begin, um, let's begin with a prayer. Loving and amazing God, you have blessed us with words this morning. 
And as we read your word, Lord, we know that these scriptures have come from years, years before we were born. And yet they still bring life and hope to us today. And, and so, Lord, as we seek to find meaning in these words, as we seek to find ways that we can make these words a part of who we are, We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you open our hearts and minds to the message you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you and to all who hear them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When Sergeant First Class Alwyn Cash woke up on the morning of October 17, 2005, He had no idea that in just a few hours he would become an unlikely hero. Cash was deployed to Samara, Iraq with the 3rd Infantry Division when the armored Bradley fighting vehicle he, he was in rolled over an improvised explosive device. He was slightly injured by the explosion and he was drenched in fuel. And then he realized that the fuel cell had erupted and the vehicle had burst into flames. Cash repeatedly entered the burning, vi- the burning vehicle without any regard to, for his personal safety in order to save six of his fellow soldiers and also an interpreter. He was severely burned and he died a few d- weeks later. He was initially approved for the Silver Star and is now being considered for the Medal of Honor. And if he receives it, he will be the first African American to receive the Medal of Honor for the Iraqi War. If Cash had survived his injuries, he probably would describe his actions as simply doing his duty. He was an ordinary person who was called to complete an extraordinary task. But for the soldiers whose lives he saved, he was much more than ordinary. On that particular day, Cash was their unlikely hero. He sacrificed his own life so that others might live. The whole idea of unlikely heroes is not a new thing. The Bible is full of stories of how God takes ordinary people and transforms them into unlikely heroes in order to accomplish the purpose and promises of the kingdom of God. Jesus calls each one of us into mission also. And it's through the carrying out of this mission that God transforms us into one of those unlikely heroes, very possibly in a way that we can't even imagine. So this morning, as we dive into Scripture from Judges, we have an opportunity to learn about three very ordinary people who were called by God to carry out an enormous mission for the kingdom. But like every story in the Bible, this is not just a story. It's not just a historical account. It's a narrative about people's faith in God. And so as we hear their story, it's really important that we make an effort to place ourselves inside the story and think about what it might have been like to be Deborah or Barak or Jael and then use those thoughts as a catalyst to consider how God might want to use us as we strive to be disciples in the 21st century. Now, in order to understand this passage in Judges that we read, it's important that we become familiar with the wider context. Deborah's story falls right in the middle of a period of a few hundred years, and which, which actually served as a transition between the leadership of jo- Joshua and the kings that would, would eventually rule Israel. And Deborah is an obscure prophet, prophetess that doesn't get mentioned very much. In fact, in the, as we read the names of the people on my stole, the women on my stole, who some, somebody decided as they embroidered this, who was important, Deborah was left off. But yet she was a very important prophetess and judge, and she served a very important role in the history of of Judea. 
And what we learn as we, as we start to read her story is that the Israeli people entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Moses got them out of Egypt and through the desert, and Joshua got to take them into the promised land. And, and his story shares some of the remarkable battles that, that they had to undergo in order to conquer that land. But now, Israel exists more, more or less as a loose confederation of tribes. They no longer have that strong leader that, like Moses or Joshua to lead them. And they fell into a, a, into a familiar cycle of existence that's repeated over and over. If you remember from the beginning of the, of the service, the cycle is that the Israelites turn away from following the way of God. They do evil, and they worship some of those idols that Pastor Duane talked about last week. The, the Lord then hands them over to an oppressing nation. They cry out to the Lord for help. The Lord rescues them through a judge. And then after the death of that judge, unfortunately, the pattern repeats itself. And so we enter this story of Deborah after 20 years of oppression from the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are described as having superior military strength. Any army that could support 900 iron warhorse drawn chariots most likely had thousands of foot soldiers as well. And our scripture tells us that Deborah sends for Barak and commands him to raise an army of 10,000 men to go and face the Canaanites. And God will ensure that Israel is victorious. Now, as we think about military might, 900 war horse chariots, 10,000 men. You think, why, why couldn't Israel win that battle? But a war horse drawn chariot was a very modern contraption, invention, in, in those days. And you have a horse, and you have a chariot, and you have up to a half a dozen, usually about three, but sometimes up to a half a dozen men bearing swords and clubs and big shields. And they just ride through the foot soldiers and knock them down. Because this was hundreds of years before David shot down Goliath with Remember what he used? His, his weapon of choice was a slingshot and a stone because they were still using swords. And so hundreds of years before that, they were using clubs and swords and they weren't, they weren't that um, developed. And these men, these men that, these men that, that Barak was being asked to to gather together and go against these iron war horses were going against a mighty, mighty modern army. But God says, I will ensure that Israel is victorious. I will deliver Sisera to you. And so if we stop here, where our passage ends with what we read today, we might think, wow, God is so awesome. Look what God can do. Every time the Israelites cry out to God. Every time Israel faces an overwhelming force, God is there to rescue them. But the story keeps going. The story continues, and, and this is what happens. Barak agrees to go, but Barak agrees under certain conditions. Barak says to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I won't go. And then she says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and she went with Bar Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 warriors went up behind him. And Deborah went with him. Now at this point, as we read that particular, or that portion of the scripture, we might start to question the courage of Barak, because why would he 
be unwilling to go into battle unless a woman goes with him. And there's really no way to know Barak's mindset here because it's not revealed in, in the text. But we can speculate. We can speculate that Barak might have been fearful to take his meager ar- army into, the ba- into battle to, to face this better equipped and stronger foe. But more than likely, Barak didn't trust what Deborah was saying. Deborah spoke for God. She said, the Lord commands you. And so if, if, if Deborah was really speaking for God, then she would believe it too, and she would go with him. And that was kind of the test that Barak had for, for Deborah. If you trust what God is saying, I will trust what God is saying. But if you won't go with me, then I'm not sure that God is going to give me victory. And this condition is one of the things that we have to wrestle with. Because as we continue through the story of Judges, the conditions become greater and greater. Because the people's trust of the Lord, or their trust in God, becomes less and less. And they need more signs in order to to, um, follow what God is asking them to do. But because uh, because of Barak's lack of faith, because he didn't immediately obey God's command... God now is going to do something very unique, and he is going to give Sisera into the hands of a woman, and the woman is going to receive the honor of destroying the foe. And before I continue, I want to remind you that this is not a scripture that we usually um, preach to young children. We don't preach this in, in church very often because it's a battle scene. It's the battle scene in the Bible, and we don't usually preach about murder being a good thing in, when we talk about the Bible. But ultimately, at the end of this scripture, Sisera is go- going to die. And it's go- she's going to die, or he is going to die at the hands of a woman. But at this point in the story, we may think that because, because Barak asked Deborah to go with him, that Deborah is going to be that woman, but God actually has another surprise for us. And we're going to see that in just a minute. And so as the story continues, Barak takes his 10,000 men, and Deborah accompanies him as he heads into battle. And one thing that is very common throughout the Hebrew scriptures is that the Israelis often fight battles that they should lose. God will say to someone, gather up 30 of your men and go face that army of 1,000, and I will make sure that you win. Now think about that. That's unreasonable. But the Israelis always win. Um, Pastor Duane last week made a reference to the wall of Jericho. That was another, another time when the, the battle should have been lost. The Israelis should not have won. But God found a way. God found a way for the Israelis to win. And this is what happens in the battles that are, that are described in the Bible, is something extraordinary and unexpected is going to occur, which brings victory to the Israelis. And this battle was no exception, because from a strategic standpoint, you have to be a soldier almost to understand this, but from a strategic standpoint, what God is instructing Barak to do here doesn't make any sense at all. He is sending him up a mountain, They're already down here, and they could just go around and attack on the plain, but instead he sends them up a mountain and wants them to charge down the mountain into this group of people who are are ready to fight a battle with iron chariots and war horses. So they're waiting, and they can see the Israeli army coming down the mountain right into their war horses. Only... Only a really, a, a really brave person or a really stupid person would choose that battle strategy. But God says, this is what you're to do. Go up to the top of the mountain, come down and attack the troops on the plain below. And, and here's what happened. The unexpected thing is that in that valley, there's the Kishon River. And God caused the thunderstorm. 
a good one like we had last night. And the rain <laughs> overflowed the banks of the river and the chariots became useless in the mud. And so while all those soldiers were trying to get their horses out of the mud, the Israeli army came down and overcame, overcame the army. God did just what he promised. God promised a victory. God allowed Barak and his men to completely wipe out Sisera's army. And in all the chaos, however, Sisera managed to escape. So there was one more thing that Barak had to do, and he had to chase down Sisera and capture or kill him. And that would end the war. Once you lost your military leader, the war was over. And this is where the story gets even more interesting because earlier in the passage, there's this reference to a man named Hebar or Heber. And this, this is a man who had aligned himself with Sisera and, and the king, the Canaanite king, and he had settled in the land of Kadesh, which was very near where the battle took place. So Sisera flees the battle and goes to the encampment where, where Heber, Heber had his tent, hoping to find refuge. And the wife of Heber says, come into my tent. I will give you refuge. Because apparently she disagrees with, with where her, her husband's loyalty lies. And what she does is she, cover, she lets him hide under a rug. And while he's there, now remember, he had just fought a battle and he had run away from the battle scene. So he's very thirsty. So he asks her for some water and she gives him warm milk. When I read that the first time, I'm thinking, okay, warm milk. But as you continue to read, what do you do when you drink warm milk? You get tired and sleepy. You fall asleep. So this man who was exhausted from the battle drinks some warm milk. He's warm and he's under a carpet and he falls asleep. And Heber, who disagrees with where her husband's loyalty lies, then drives a tent peg through his skull. That's why this scripture doesn't get taught a lot. All right. And, and, and it's just one of those, it's, it's just what she did. And, and part of what we want to see in that is she used what she had available. She's just an ordinary housewife she used what she had available. And, um, and there's a lot of culturalism that goes into that, that story because in, in Jewish culture or Canaanite culture, you would not enter a woman's tent if you were not married to her. That was just something that didn't happen. And so she invites him into the tent and he goes into it knowing that no one would look for him there because you... Even if you're trying to save your life, you wouldn't go into a woman's tent. It's just something that, that is not right. And, and then, of course, later, a few minutes later, Barak has chased Sisera and figured out where he is. And Barak, Barak then is invited into, into the tent. Jael invites him into the tent and says, Look, I'm giving you this person that you're looking for. Barak sees that he's already dead. And so God's promise is fulfilled. God delivered Sisera into the hands of a woman. Jael gets to go down in history with the honor. Barak does not. But if we fast forward into the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, we do see Barak, and there's a, there's a chapter that just recounts all the people of faith, and Barak is one of those people of faith. So he is remembered because he won the battle, he's a great soldier. He's not remembered, however, for killing Sisera. And while Deborah's story is quite unique and interesting, what we have to figure out now is how, how is that story relevant to our lives? How can we apply it to what we're doing here in the 21st century? And the first thing we need to see is that Deborah, Barak, and Jael are all heroes or heroines in this story. And each person, each person from the beginning of the story was only equipped with ordinary skills. Barak was a soldier, not an extraordinary soldier. In fact, he was somewhat reluctant. Deborah was a wife and a prophetess and a judge. Jael is a housewife 
And another thing that you need to know about wives during that time is that the wives always set up camp. So Jael, Jael knew how to hammer a tent peg into the ground. So she had that skill. And God used her skills and her ability in order to, to make sure that, that what God's vision was for that part, portion of history was fulfilled. And God is using ordinary people to carry out extraordinary tasks. But there's also a couple of other implications that we need to think about. And one of those implications is how we see God and the other is how we see ourselves. Because when it comes to character, God is always consistent. God is holy, just, righteous, loving, truthful, and gracious, merciful, and many other things. And throughout the scriptures, we see these characteristics, not always all of them at the same time, but if we read the scope of a scripture, we, we see a pattern. And the characteristics are the things that we recognize and the things that we rely on when we think of God. For instance, in, the, in, in what we read today, God still loved the Israelites even though they chose to do evil in his sight. God disciplined them by putting them under the control of the Canaanites. And then when they called out to God, God exercised grace and mercy by sending a deliverer and coming up with a plan to rescue them. And one would think, oh, wow, you know, you've got this cycle. They sin, they get disciplined, they get punished and, uh, and oppressed usually by a, by a foreign government. And then they cry out, and suddenly God raises someone up. But if Deborah was a judge that people trusted, and Barak would trust that she was speaking the word of God. She was already in place. This was not just somebody that he raised up, at, that God raised up at the last minute. She was there, and she was already in place. So she was already a part of God's plan even before the Israelis asked for help. And so when it comes to the methods of God that, when it comes that, that God chooses to use, what we need to be is careful about how we try to figure out exactly what God is going to do and how God is going to work. We can't always put God into our own little box. We have to allow God to be God. And as I mentioned before, God's plans don't always make human sense. Sometimes these plans seem very overwhelming and, and doomed for failure. In today's passage, Barak didn't trust God's plans enough to go out on his own. He needed the assurance of Deborah's presence. And because of that, even though Barak led his army to victory, Jael was the one who overcomes Sisera. And this may seem like a very tiny detail, but God's plan was to deliver the Israelites. And that happened. One of the themes that, that constantly shows up continually in Hebrew scripture is the idea that when God gives us the opportunity to help or to save oppressed people and we hesitate or we do nothing, another leader will be called until God's plan is carried out. We might perish along with the oppressed people that God is trying to, to rescue, but ultimately God will prevail. God is God. And we have to allow God to be God. When we are invited to participate in God's work, we can either join in or we can hesitate. But God's plan will prevail. The second implication has to do with how we see ourselves. And we have to remember that God is capable of making anyone, including me and including you, into an unlikely hero. As Dwayne pointed out, earlier with some of the women that he talked about. All of us are people that God uses in order to, to achieve the mission. The mission. And the mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so even though God doesn't really need us, God chooses to use us in order to, to carry out the mission because God wants us to be transformed while we carry out this mission. Barak really didn't have enough faith to carry out 
what God was wanting him to do. But God had faith in him. And that's something we can take from this passage. God has faith in us. What God wants to do with this world is way beyond our wild, wildest dreams. But God has faith in us. God knows that we have what it takes to, be, to, to answer the call. And as we carry out our discipleship, we are able to transform the world. And there's a lot of things that we're called to do, as, do in this world as Christians. But there's also a lot of times that we fail to do them because we don't have enough faith. We allow injustice and oppression to occur. We disregard simple safeguards because they're uncomfortable or we don't like them. We ignore sexual misconduct because we are embarrassed or we're afraid to speak out. But these are the things that Jesus would never ignore. God calls us to action regardless of our gender, race, physical abilities, natural talents, finances, or any other factor that we might use to, to pick out for a leadership role. And the fact is that God can use whomever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. If God could use a female prophetess and a judge who lived in a male-dominated world, a reluctant military leader, and a housewife with a tent peg, and, and these are the, the instruments through which God freed the Israelites from oppression, from the Canaanites, then certainly God is capable of using any of us. We have talents that God can use. We have talents that can work for the continuation of God's mission in the world. And, and I know that for me, the knowledge that God actually chooses to work through me is humbling. It's humbling to think that the God who spoke the universe into being knows who I am. God knows my name. God knows the gifts that I have. And God knows exactly when those gifts are going to be needed. And the fact that God wants to include me in the divine work that happens here on earth, that's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And, it, and it, it tells me that I always need to be on the lookout for a possibility. Because we think those minor encounters that we have with individuals out in the world are just minor encounters that happen out in the world. But for one person, that encounter that you have when you share Christ's love, when, when a person's not expecting it, can, pro can save someone's life. And that is why we cannot separate our worship from what we do inside this building or during this time from the rest of our lives. And here's the thing. G making me into an unlikely hero is obviously God's work. It's not something that I can do on my own. But God is not going to force me to be a hero either. If I say no, God will choose someone else. I am continuously invited to join with God when, when, wherever God is at work. But I also have to make the choice to say, yes, I will follow you. I will put away those idols and I will serve you. As we said last week, choose today whom you will serve. Say yes to that invitation and allow God to use me and transform me. Because when we get involved in the good that God is doing in the world, we ourselves are transformed. This is not something that we do on our own. So my guess is that when you woke up this morning, you weren't thinking about being a hero or a heroine. But that's exactly what God has called each one of us to become. So I hope that that sounds really exciting for you. It should be. Because when we think about the fact that just three people who were willing to be unlikely heroes were used by God to overcome the, the whole army of an entire nation, it should cause us to marvel at what God could do through a congregation like this. People who are willing to be used for God's purposes. And to me, 
That's an exciting thought. I hope it's exciting for you too. Let us pray. Loving and amazing God, you have called us into discipleship. You have called us to be people that we can't even imagine who we might possibly be. But as we are here this morning, we ask you to reach deep inside our hearts and find that courage that we sometimes can't find on our own. Give us the strength to follow you, to lead others into discipleship. Help us to be the love that you want us to be for this world. We pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. No.
if you find yourself in a place you didn't ask for. Aren't we all there? But friend, there is grace. There is grace. Would you pray with me? O holy God of Israel, you faithfully keep the promises you have made to our ancestors and have led your people into the future, providing hospitality along the way. Help us who inherit this pilgrim life to journey faithfully at your command. O God of captives and pilgrims, you brought your people home from despair and gave them a land of freedom and plenty. Look now in mercy upon us, your servants, and deliver us from our wilderness of self-centeredness and sin. Bring us home to justice, to sharing, to compassion, to love. As you heard the prayers of your people throughout time, O God, and guided them in the way of your love, so listen now to those who call upon you. We lift up those in our community, those loved ones in our families and in our friends. We lift up the family of Carolyn Moore as she has been welcomed into your arms. And we pray for Dwayne, Dale Forsyth's brother, in the hospital, needing your healing touch. We remember those in our rehab and extended care, Janet and Peggy, Dawn and Charles, Betty and Harry, those veterans who have served and those who are serving now in our military, who are loved ones to our family and community. Jim and Anthony, Kevin and Ben, Kevin and Alex, Kim, Gerald and Isaiah. And those who have named these friends and family members so that we will remember them in our prayers. Stanley and Debbie and Michael, Joe, Carolyn, David and Betty. For Charlie and Miriam and Kim, Ryan, John, Sarah, Charlie, and all those who are affected by the coronavirus. Oh, holy God, thank you for calling us. We thank you for the great example of Deborah who was ready and willing to be used by you in the most difficult of times and circumstances. There are so many people of influence in our world, those with loud voices and deep pockets, those with large lives and wide networks. But you call your leaders, leaders like Deborah. As we struggle to keep our broken humanity from splintering into more and more irreparable fragments, as we wrestle with our greed or arrogance, our ignorance or short-sightedness, our violence or coldness, our carelessness or narcissism, you call out your leaders. Where are the leaders? Raise up for us, O oh God, leaders worthy of the name, men and women who, like Christ, are unafraid of challenge, unashamed to serve and unattached to their own personal gain. Men and women who, like Christ, call to the best within us and then lead the way. Help us to answer the call. Help us to be those leaders and help us, no matter our circumstances, no matter how small our sphere, no matter how few we reach or know or touch that God has still chosen us 
to be a leader and to be the leaders that God seeks. Leaders who follow in the way of Jesus, the Christ who led and showed the life of love, the life of servanthood, and the life of the one who guides us. And so we come to you in his spirit and in his name as we prepare to pray the prayer that he taught us saying together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen friends as we think about the word that we have heard today, the message that we have received, the story in Pastor Lauren's message, the story of, of God's people who were not perfect people, who were faithful then failed, faithful then forgot, but always called and invited back to that place of faithfulness. And so as we think about returning to God that which God has given to us to be faithful people, we remember God's invitation to put God first, to put those idols aside and put God front and center in our lives. And one of the ways that we are invited and encouraged to do that is to share the gifts that God has asked us to return with God for the ministry of Christ and our community. Please remember and give generously in the ways that you give through electronic means, through giving through your checks by mail, or by coming here into the church and leaving your offerings. Let us be faithful. And one other way that we remember Christ is by sharing Christ's peace. And I want to invite you to stand and share the peace of Christ with those worshiping around you. And if you are at home, to send messages of peace to each other by uh, the, the, the uh, text function, the chat function on our YouTube page. Maybe send a text to each other. Um, send. I got some great messages after the, after the kids moment. <laughs> when I looked at the camera and said, um, are y'all gathered around? Uh, I got a text from a parent that said they were wondering whether it was a Zoom call because someone was still in their pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so we know we are worshiping together. Let us continue to worship through our through song and praise. Oh 
Now, as we prepare to leave the worship space and go back into the world, remember that Jesus loves you. And to go out into that world knowing that love and share that love with each and every person that you meet. God calls us, Jesus calls us to be his disciples. And part of that discipleship, part of that discipleship, is participating in the good that God is already doing. Go in peace.